Welcome to episode seven of Wild About Wildlife. I'm your host, Kathy Mueller. In this episode, I'm joined by Salt Haven founder, Brian Salt, along with our very special guest, Amber Marshall, star of the longtime running hit CBC series, Heartland. Amber has been a longtime supporter of Salt Haven, dating back to the days when she volunteered in our clinic as a teenager. Brian and I had a chance to sit down with Amber earlier this year to reminisce about her time at Salt Haven and to see how she was able to merge her love of animals with her other passion, acting. First of all, I just want to say that it does mean a lot for me to be on this podcast because Salt Haven was a big part of my, my youth. And, um, and I owe a lot to Salt Haven for kind of giving me those, those value systems and those, those just kind of general good, kind-hearted ideas. And, and I think that every, every person goes through that in their life where they're trying to figure out who they are, who they want to be, and it's the people around you that really shape who you are. So I want to thank Brian, first off, for everything thank that you. you do and all of the, the kindness and the good that you share with those around you, too. Well, you're welcome. And thank you for those kind words. <laughs> you're welcome. But yeah, just, I guess, animal loving girl from London, Ontario. And I was involved in a lot of different, I, I like to volunteer at um, animal shelters, kids horse camps, things like that, because I just wanted to feed that animal loving soul inside me. And then when I was in high school, it was one of my teachers, Mr. Campbell, who introduced me to Salt Haven in the beginning. And it was just one of those things where it fit, right? I knew I was like, this is something that is I can do good, I can be around animals, and I can be around like minded people that are wanting to do better for the world. And those are all the things that, that you want as a teenager, right? You want to be involved with people that inspire you and that encourage you to do all the things that you really love to do and, and to do it in a positive way. So I reached out to you and your team, and I was able to come on board that summer and do some volunteering with Salt Haven. And I was, I was hooked right, right from the beginning. I said, this is such an amazing, it's an amazing organization, but it's the people that make it so incredible. And as you know, as I think most know who know me, I am an animal lover through and through. And so any chance for me to be around any type of animal makes me happy right to my core. But it's also being around those people that inspire you and make you want to be a better person yourself. So I think that's kind of an all encompassing feel that I got at my time at Salt Haven. And, and Brian, what do you remember of, of Amber? Do you, did she stand out in any way? Was, was she, you know, just part of the, the annual group of volunteers who were being onboarded? What, what stood out maybe a little bit about Amber when she first came to Salt Haven? Well, the one thing I remember about Amber was that she was always positive. And, you know, it, the, the summers in southwestern Ontario are hot and humid and they can be dusty when the wind kicks up. And it, it's and you're working with animals that um, are sick or injured. And so, you know, it takes a little bit of of energy to be up all the time. But Amber was just that. She always wore a smile on her face. I could never figure it out. And um, she should come eager to work. And most of our volunteers are. But Amber was just, when things got really, really tough, she would, She just had that uh, <laughs> that vibrance about her that was just really, really nice. And that's, that's what I remember about Amber. Thank you, and, Brian. And Amber, what and were you... Oh, sorry. Yeah, I was just going to say, like, what exactly yeah. were you doing? Well, <laughs> lots of stinky jobs. I mean, that's <laughs> that's the part of animals that people don't realize, too. It's like they see the cute and, the, oh, you know, you're feeding baby animals. and But with that feeding comes a lot of the other, too. You know, we were cleaning up after very messy birds and ducks and geese and all kinds of things that um, I still don't know how Pauline let you put all that in her washing machine. But <laughs> we, would, we would go out, we would take all of the bedding from all the different cages, whether it be squirrel pens or birds or any animal that was in there and we would first hose them down to get most of the animal feces and whatever else was on these blankets and then we would put them in the laundry basket to be put in the washer and dryer 
But, you know, it's things like that that I think really make you appreciate the whole journey, right? Because it's not just about feeding and helping and, and splinting wings and, and doing things like that. It's, it's the nitty gritty, dirty hard work as well that really makes it pay off in the end. And I remember that one of my favorite things about the whole experience was the fact that it was so fast paced. There was never a moment where you were bored because all of these baby animals need to be fed all the time, right around the clock. And there would be timers set up for all these baby birds that needed to be fed and you would be in the bird room. And at the time, this was just a little tiny shed. Brian, I'm I'm sure you remember fondly of this space that just was covered with little baby animals everywhere. And these timers are going off, you know, and, and you're just going, okay, what next? And you're checking sheets and you're wanting to make sure that you're doing the right thing too, right? Because each of these animals has a different feed requirement. Some are injured, some need medication. There's all kinds of things that are going around the clock. And it takes that time and dedication of those people there to work as a team to make sure that nobody gets missed. Because that's the thing too. If you have a lot of people out there trying to help out and you're not communicating, then somebody's going to get missed or somebody's going to be fed twice. And that's something that is crucial with these baby animals. That's a matter of life or death. So I think that was what I really enjoyed about the experience is the fact that we were all working together for that common goal. We wanted these animals to succeed and be able to be released. And so it was just like this, this adrenaline rush of, okay, we got to get in there. It's go time. The timers are going off. We're feeding baby animals. And then in between all that, you're trying to clean pens and you're trying to make sure that the ones that are outside are still safe and happy and have water and food. And it just it's kind of one of those things that I think prepares you or helps prepare you for the chaos of the regular world. And I think that as a teenager, it was one of the best things I could experience because life is not perfect. There's always going to be something going on. There's always going to be that emergency that you're not prepared for. And I think the more training you can have towards that, the better off you're going to be in life as a whole. Amber brought up the point, you know, how small the clinic was. It was really a shed. It was a 20 by 15 foot shed and it, we called it a clinic and it had an air conditioner. <laughs> and I think on rainy days when everything was inside, it was uh, the most common heard words were, oh, excuse me, oh, excuse me, because <laughs> it was so tight in there. It was pretty amazing. Yeah. <laughs> And Amber, when uh, when you were talking about being a teenager and doing all the laundry at Salt Haven, and it struck me that it was probably pretty hard as a teenager, like for any teenager, for mom to get a teenager to do laundry at home. But at Salt Haven, it was kind of a different experience. Well, when it's for an animal, there's no questions <laughs> asked. If it was for myself. But I think what helped me in my position at Salt Haven as I also worked at a veterinary clinic. So I was already used to kind of dealing with the traumas that came in, the caring for sick and injured animals. And there was lots of um, dirty jobs there too. You know, when you start out as a teen in a vet clinic, you're not given the, the nicest jobs, right? You're given the, okay, let's go scrub that pen of some pretty nasty stuff. And I think that for me, that was that was one of the best teachers I could have because still to this day, I'm out there, I have a lot of my own animals. And so now when I'm faced with that, either it could be an injury or trauma that those animals have, I'm a little bit better prepared to deal with it myself. And I think that, you know, that first initial kind of getting right down to the problem is very important. And then, of course, calling in the right people, having a vet on call, having someone come out that really knows what they're doing. But being able to get in there and not have that squeamish stomach or, you know, I've had all that training where the sight of blood doesn't bother me and um, the sight of some some messy, messy things that come along with animals is just something that's kind of been just ingrained in me that that's just how it is when you're when you're working with animals it's going to get messy sometimes and then like you were saying so many of those skills are transferable to outside of the animal world so right not being squeamish at the sight of blood could help you if someone you care about is injured a person exactly no it's it's yeah. so true and i think too not just those values, not just that kind of um, idea, but also 
there's if you can read animals and you can understand when an animal's in pain or an animal's suffering or they're uncomfortable, then you can read people a lot better because people are not as subtle as animals. And for me, being around all of these incredible creatures that don't speak, but yet they do, you learn to listen on a different level. And I think that's one thing that's really kind of helped me in my adult years is that understanding the animal language allows you to understand human language a lot better as well. And to understand when someone, because people don't always tell the truth too, right? Someone could say, yeah, I'm fine, but you know, they're not fine. And it's, it's learning to read those subtle cues that animals give off every minute you're with them. And humans do the same thing. We just usually are programmed not to notice. So I think that's one thing that animals have, have done for me that kind of gives you, gives you a better read on, on the humans in your life as well. You talked about how you were working at a vet's when you started at Salt Haven. So you you walked through the door. You already had some training under your belt. Can you talk about the training that you got at Salt Haven? Because, you know, we get a new batch of volunteers every year. We tell them when they apply, listen, you don't need any experience whatsoever because we will put you through your paces and make sure that you're trained to Salt Haven standards. So can you talk a little bit about the the training, what you remember that you got at Salt Haven? I think one of the, the most important things right off the beginning was the fact that I did feel like I was welcomed. You know, I didn't feel like it was, okay, you don't know what you're doing, just step aside, watch us. It was very hands-on. And I, that's how I learn. And I think that's how a lot of people learn is not just by being told something, but by doing it and being allowed to make a few mistakes. And so I think that going through and having a really good mentor, and I remember right off the bat, it was Liz who was there and she kind of took me under her wing and she's like, this is, this is how we do it. And this is the systems and this is why. And I think that's so important with any type of job you're doing is to know the reason behind something because then you can understand it. And it's like, okay, so why do we uh, have this batch of birds outside and why are this, why are they inside on this batch? And it's just learning the different needs of every animal and being able to directly have that open communication so that you understand why something's done the way it is. And for me, it was totally different than the vet clinic because the vet clinic, they were all owned animals that were in as patients. The owners had their own specific requirements for these animals. So, you know, even if, and that's one thing that's really difficult about being a veterinarian is knowing that there's one way that might be the best way, but it's always up to the owner of the animal. And it's, it's hard. You have to kind of, Almost when I was talking about reading people, you have to put it in a way that you know that you're going to be able to do what's best for that animal without the owner intervening. Whereas with the wildlife, we're just doing what's best for them, right? It's it's not a matter of um, someone saying, no, no, I don't want that for my dog or no, it's it, this is something that we don't believe in. It's just this is this animal needs care. What is the best way to go about it? And I think that that's really important. And it was a way for me to kind of understand the needs of each individual animal and what to do in that situation. And how long did you end up being a volunteer at Salt Haven for? I was there a couple years. And then shortly after um, I graduated from high school, I was given the opportunity to film a show in Alberta. And so that took me across the country. And I, I ended up falling in love with this place. And now for 18 years, I have lived in Alberta. And it just it felt like home to me right away. And I know, Brian, you have some children here. So you understand the the draw, right? And it's just something I think that when you feel connected to a place, when you feel that you're truly at home somewhere, there's no guessing. It just it just felt like an instant relax. Right. I got out here. I was just like, this is where I'm supposed to be. You you said you were drawn out there initially for an acting role. Is was that another passion of yours that kind of went alongside the the animals as you were growing yeah, up? Or how did how did that come about? Since I was just a little girl, as young as I can remember, that my two great passions were acting and animals. And there's even a a recording somewhere out there of me when I was about three years old and I'm singing this song that I'm going to be a farmer and I'm going to live out in the country. And 
So right from the beginning, not only was I expressing that I wanted to be around animals, but I was doing it in the most theatrical way. And so my parents recognized this. And when I was around eight years old, they put me in the original kids theater company. And that was probably the best thing they could have done to channel all of my inner theatrical being into something that I could perform and I could actually perform for someone other than my poor parents that would have to sit there and, <laughs> and, listen and, and watch these shows that would go on forever. And so I think at that point, that's when I really realized how much I enjoyed being able to, to present, to, you know, to present my craft or however you want to say it. And shortly after that, I auditioned for Lester B. Pearson School for the Arts, which is in London. And I was accepted to that. So I went there from grade four to grade eight. And that really just kind of harnessed all of that energy inside me and put it towards something where I actually had an outlet. And so then when I was 12 years old, I went to Toronto. Well, my mom took me to Toronto. I didn't go by myself. <laughs> and I ended up getting an agent for the acting side of things. So for television, we, we mostly just focused on... Um, like television series and movies, because driving from London to Toronto was, you know, not just an everyday thing you wanted to do. Uh, and then shortly after that, I got a role on a kid's show called Super Rupert. And that was when I was 12 years old. And that was my first kind of intro into the world of film, film and television. And so I loved it. I loved every minute of it. And I continued to pursue different jobs over the years. But then I was in high school and I really did want to focus on my schooling as well, because at that time I was destined to be a veterinarian. That's what I thought. I was like, I'm going to be a vet. I never thought of acting as an actual job. I thought it was something I did for fun. It was something that it was a nice hobby, but I was going to be a vet. And when I was 14, I started working in a veterinary clinic and I loved it. I really did. But it started to change the way I looked at things because I said, I can still have animals in my life. I can still help animals, but I don't have to be a veterinarian to do this. And I think that I looked at things a little differently because it wasn't just about helping the animals. It was about pleasing the owners. And that was one thing where I, I became a little bit jaded because I was like, wait a minute here. I thought I was going to become a vet so that I could help animals. But now there's this whole other political side to things where you have to manage that balance of keeping the owners happy, keeping the animals happy and healthy. And I, I kind of had a little bit of a shift. I was like, hmm, this is interesting, but I still enjoyed it. So I continued working there all through high school. And then when I was 18, I auditioned for a show called Heartland. And again, this was not something that I thought of as a career by any means. This was something that I was still doing on the side for fun. You know, I would I would do a movie once a year, maybe, or a role on a television series, just something that only took up two or three weeks of my time. So I ended up getting this role and coming out to film the pilot of Heartland. And that was in 2007, I believe. And uh, I just, I've instantly, as I said before, fell in love with Alberta. However, pilots usually never get picked up. The chances of a pilot going are like one in 50, maybe not quite that much, but it was something that I was like, okay, that was fun. I've done pilots in the past, never seen anything from them. So it was just one of those things where I was like, that was a really cool experience. I got to see Alberta, goodbye. <laughs> I went back to <laughs> London and I didn't think about it because that's, that's how I, that's how I kind of maintained normalcy in this world of film and television because if you think about something too much you're disappointed when it doesn't go through so my whole idea when i was involved in acting and auditioning because sometimes you're auditioning two three four times a week and you might never hear so if you think about it too much then it's just going to become all consuming and it's going to drive you crazy so my whole outlook when i was auditioning or acting was i'm going to do it and i'm going to do the best i can and then i'm going to wipe it from my mind and just kind of make it as oh that was a really fun experience it was a vacation i'm done the vacation i'm back to real life and so then i guess it was around march or april i got a call from my agent and he said yeah, they're looking at picking up Heartland for a season. So they want you to go back out to Alberta for the summer and film season one. I was like, how cool is this? You know, usually pilots don't get picked up. This is really exciting. I get to go back out to Alberta. So I went out to Alberta for um, that first season of Heartland. We filmed from July until close to November. 
And so I got a good taste of, of most of the seasons out here in the, the bitter cold and um, really, really enjoyed my experience. But again, I didn't think it was going to go any further than that. It was one of those things where I said, wow, that was really cool. I met a lot of great people. I had a really great time. But that chapter's closed and we're done because we had no mention of going for season two. Well, the first season of Heartland was so well received by so many people that they decided to renew again. So at this point, now we're going into season two and I'm thinking, okay, this is really cool. And I love Alberta. And if I can have a job out there, I want to live out there. So that's when I started looking for more of a permanent place to stay. And it was, there was really no question to it. And, and the cool thing about it was I had already made so many great friends and contacts out here. So I didn't feel like I was this, cause I was 19, I guess at the time, I didn't feel like I was just picking up and moving my life across the country without knowing anyone. I had a job to come to. I had friends. I, I knew a bunch of um, ranchers in the area that let me ride their horses and go out and gather cows and just do things that I had always sort of dreamed of doing. And it just felt like the right fit. And so then flash forward, um, we just completed season 17 this last year. So it's, it's the show that never ends. <laughs> That's part one of our conversation with former Salt Haven volunteer Amber Marshall. In part two, we explore how life mimics art for Amber, being on set of the CBC show Heartland, and the challenges of working with animals that don't always want to adhere to a schedule set by humans. Part two of In Conversation with Amber Marshall will be out in mid-July. In the meantime, if you like this episode, make sure to share it and don't forget to subscribe so you never miss an episode of Wild About Wildlife. Mm -hmm.